Michael Jordan has tied up the ball game with a brand Summer of 1994, only two years into the real world. That's me alongside college buddy Matt Garvey. And Michael Jordan. You have to look a little closer, but that's MJ fielding ground balls in between us. Garvey and I were both working our first jobs after graduation. He was media relations director for South Carolina's Greenville Braves, double-A ball for Atlanta. And hysteria was escalating as Jordan had just been assigned to the White Sox double-A affiliate Birmingham Barons. So I get a call from Garvey one morning telling me to book a flight to Greenville. Jordan and his circus were on the way in for a three-game series. And Garvey had me hooked up with this media credential. I couldn't get on a plane fast enough with the same common 35 millimeter camera most everybody had. So I show up for three all access days on a baseball diamond with the world's greatest basketball player. That basically meant I could look at him but not bother him. Deal. And I wasn't about to break it with Jordan's straight faced bodyguard flanking every step. He wore number 45, same as his high school jersey. MJ was longer and lankier in person than he looked on TV but still intimidating. He showed up to an empty ballpark every morning before breakfast without teammates for extra batting practice. Walked from clubhouse to batting cage with no eye contact. I saw his hands calloused and at times bleeding from taking so many cuts in the batting cages. Michael Jordan was clearly a perfectionist, frustrated by his distance from baseball perfection. Then he was back in the cage with teammates a couple hours before first pitch. The pack of media following him was outrageous. MJ's routine with reporters, the same at every minor league park. One media conference after his opening game, then no more interviews. I was able to sneak in a question on whether he was feeling any more comfortable defensively in the outfield. He'd made an error that night. Jordan told me it was a work in progress, but that, yeah, it was coming. Every game of the series was standing room only. My 35 millimeter didn't have a panoramic, so I actually had to snap two pictures and edit them together to do justice. Fans jockeyed for position along chain link fences just for a glimpse of a guy most of them had only seen on TV. It reinforced to me how fortunate I was to be on the inside of that chain link for three straight days and nights. Never been so happy to be caged in. This is the bus Jordan reportedly bought for his team to travel in style. After all, they were making pennies to his millions. It was said to be valued at $350,000, included six TVs, a VCR, and a lounge in back. Truth was later revealed, Jordan didn't actually buy the bus. He allowed the bus company to use his name for advertising. His manager that season, some guy named Terry Francona. Michael Jordan played every game of that series. The Barons won 65 that season, but lost 74. Jordan then returned to Chicago as MJ to win three more NBA world titles in a row. Thanks to Brandon Sullivan for his master editing and videography on that feature. I have one more Michael Jordan story. Garvey and I ran into him and his teammates at a bar called Chiefs one night after a game. Jordan was drinking Zima, but you'll have to catch me in person for the rest of that story. We're back after this. <laughs> 